Pony Express. Check out their line of penetration testing devices, including the Pone Pad, Pone Phone, and Pone Pro. For enterprises, there's Pone Pulse, providing continuous visibility into wired, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth spectrums across all physical locations, including remote sites and branch offices. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. In order to deliver the maximum degree of privacy, personal data must be protected without action from an individual. In fact, this requirement is defined in the General Data Protection Regulation, also known as GDPR. What if you could reliably and efficiently build privacy into your information security programs by default? StealthBits Technologies provide solutions that allow data to be collected and used in a manner that achieves GDPR compliance. Privacy by design and by default is not just a GDPR requirement, it's the foundation of StealthBits Technologies. Technologies. Visit StealthBits.com to learn more today. Gain control of cyber risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh, asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. Welcome back, welcome back. The first B-Sides in Uganda is upon us. I want to tell you about that before we jump into our discussion for today. B-Sides Kampala is going to be held October 14th through the 15th. The CFP is open until July 15th. Some topics of interest for your CFP include network and web application security, innovative attack and defense strategies, uh, malware analysis, biometrics, and evolutionary computing that's definitely the version of the ad that ends there. Uh, besides Kampala.com, submit your CFP today. Very excited to talk about Docker security in the enterprise. Uh, again, I, I worked with Docker a little, and I feel mm. like I've just scratched the surface. <laughs> and I have some questions, which I feel like just kind of uh, questions and topics, which I think really just scratched the surface when we talk about uh, Docker in the enterprise. Not even security related, but you showed me that great graphic. I'm trying to pull it up on my phone yeah. right now. <laughs> the graphic is fantastic. And I and that's much of what I uh, observed, or one of the things I observed is I was like, well, I want to use Docker to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And there would be a blog post or a tutorial or a GitHub that said, oh, here's how you do it. And you could totally tell it was someone that was setting up a small environment on locally. their computer locally, and they're like, yeah, this is how I got it working. And I'm like, yeah, but what about all of the things that you need when you deploy it actually in production? Exactly. Never mind deploy a small app in production, but deploy it for an enterprise that's going to be used by lots of users. It has to play with other apps and be in this whole process. For me, one of the other big takeaways is Docker changes how so drastically how you deploy mm -hmm. secure maintain applications i think overall in a good way i mean there's some issues that we'll we'll talk about but i truly believe it it's the future i think this is where we're going oh absolutely um i think it's it's fantastic i think there's a lot of things we got to work out but i think it's it's definitely the direction yep um one of the things that jumped out at me uh at first is that Docker does allow for developers to, I think, to be a little more independent and flexible, which I think is why you find it, you know, mm -hmm. hey, I need to build a Flask environment. So here's how you get one going locally on your system. I've actually done a little bit of research into doing that for security tools as well. There's actually some published Docker instances for security tools. It's kind of cool. There's one for Kali. Yeah, there's one for Kali, but there's one for individual tool. Like you can just run like WP scan, like yep. one, one Docker command, WP scan, and it spits out results. Yep. It's awesome. Um, but it makes it more flexible and platform independent. In a way, though, it makes developers and systems administrators like the same thing. Yeah. That's really concerning for me. Yep. I think you're a developer personally, Apollo, that exactly. has a systems administration background. Yep. And Docker's perfect. I would trust you deploying it because you have some, but a lot of developers don't have that context or background. Yeah. I think you need it in a way or need someone with that role to help manage your developers because your developers are now sysadmins. And I'm like, oh God, that could be really yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. 
how, how do we over do? How do we overcome that? I mean, <clears throat> well, I mean, what I like about Docker, and this is why it's been adopted by developers so much, is that it abstracts away the OS. Yes. It no longer matters that that you're running Ubuntu, that you're running Debian or Red Hat. All right. that matters is you have some machine, some dumb box somewhere that could run your container. Right. So that's kind of nice. But the reality is the container itself has its own, own OS. Admittedly, right. though, it's a much more simplistic OS, so it's a lot easier to manage. Yep. Yeah, it, it's weird, those pluses and minuses, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, developers are going to be spinning up more containers, more so than they would virtual systems. Yeah. And there are operating systems in play, but you're right. They're much more simplistic and right. don't suffer from a lot of those other security issues that, you know, like we were talking about before, like typically you have a big Unix box that runs Solaris. It's spinning up 25 different, you know, services on it and you need administrator to administrate all of the things that are happening. Whereas you can just take the bare minimum you need in an operating system mm -hmm. and run your application on it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, pluses and minuses. And, and I think that kind of leads to the next one where Docker introduces a lot of complex. I mean, depending on how you configure it, definitely some more complexity. Yeah. Could be a lot of complexity. But you can, the complexity somehow, I don't know how this happened, like allows it to be more manageable. <laughs> like it's it weird in a way where complexity leads to manageability. It seems really backwards because my security concerns lie within some of the complexity. Yeah. But like modularizing everything does have its advantages for our security as well. Exactly. And I think it comes down to you know, as human beings, we are it's much easier for us to compartmentalize. You know, human beings frankly are terrible at dealing with complex problems. We're, just, we're, we're terrible at it. We mm. can't we can't do it. Um, there's a reason we pigeonhole things and we have, you know, cliches and everything. It's because it gives it, it makes it easier for us to understand the world. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way we are. That's human beings. You know, a computer does not care that you built a monolithic app that is one gigabyte plus mm -hmm. some of the Windows games that we play, mm -hmm. you know, Fallout, New Vegas, all that stuff. Um, those are literally one gig apps. Mm -hmm. Those things are ridiculous. Um, but what Docker does, it says, we're going to split apart. We're going to have a, a barrier, a translation layer between each of these services. So basically what you're saying is MySQL will support MySQL, and it's going to be in its own environment. It's going to be over here, and it's really encapsulated. Over here, we're going to have Flask. We're going to have the web app. Over here, we're going to have the web front end. Mm. And it really it puts up a barrier between each of these layers of complexity, so that way they can be... Um, maintained and managed in and of themselves because you trust in the abstraction between them. That's right. what I see Docker as. Yeah, and it's interesting, as I started to learn it, and I learned it the hard way, right? Like I wrote all my own Docker files for each yeah. instance, which I think is was really good mm -hmm. um, because how you lay out your application in this new containerized world is so different. And you have to understand all of the little intricacies inside your application and then mm -hmm. string them together which I think is good. I think it make, it forces you to think of the service layers. Yes. So it forces you to say, this is the web front end. This is the web app. This is the um, session store. This is the memory database. This is the file store. And really put them in their own box, which is good because you, it, it, allow, it basically forces you to break down monolithic applications. Yeah. I mean, how crazy do you go breaking everything out into its own container, though? It's, it's interesting because you look at... <laughs> is there a uh, point where it just it doesn't make any sense? I mean, there's, there, there obviously is, right? Um, I would argue it comes down to just performance. We were talking about this earlier. Mm. Um, people, when they start using Docker and realizing how quick and easy to start these environments, they say, oh, my God, I'm going to spin up, you know... A thousand, you know, I do JMeter for stress testing. I'm going to spin up a thousand JMeter instances. It's going to mm -hmm. run awesome and so fast. It's going to run a thousand X faster. It actually doesn't. Because you're only able to optimize the performance of these things with as many threads as mm -hmm. your system has. So, like, my laptop is dual core, quad thread. Once I get beyond five Docker containers, mm -hmm. the performance is not going to be any faster. Mm. Um, so, you got to kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're uh, scaling out Docker. And that's why when you're on Amazon, you usually get, like, a really big, chunky, you know, 16-core system and kind of use that as your base layer. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it does allow you to scale out horizontally really nicely because it, it enforces those um, divisions between each of the layers. Right. But you know you're going to hit that performance wall. So yeah, you can scale out to like a thousand instances of MySQL, but you're not going to. It's not going to go any faster. Well, it, also, I mean, I kind of liken it to network segmentation as well. Like 
there's a yep. balancing act, right? Like exactly. you don't want everything on its own subnet, but you don't want every host inside of their own subnet either because that would be would breed so much complexity exactly. that security would suffer. And I, Docker to me was a similar situation. Right? That's a really interesting concept. I haven't really thought about that, but no, you're exactly right. Um, yeah, because you can segment out things so much. Yeah, mm. That's a good one. Um, so the where I was going with that was the next topic was when you look at your application or, you know, if you're an enterprise and you have thousands of applications, right, like that complexity can get, can be multiplied a thousand mm -hmm. times, right? If you have a thousand, maybe you don't have a thousand, maybe you have a couple of hundred applications. Unless you're Netflix. Right? Yeah, unless you're Netflix, right? Like I've seen one of the diagrams they made of all their container services, mm -hmm. of their microservices. Um, there's over like 300 of them mm. that run Netflix. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. So... But now the containers have to communicate with each other. Yep. And what I found in my research is, like, not only do you need to understand the services in the file systems and get those all working together, mm -hmm. then there's a networking le communications layer, I should say, because it's not it's not even really networking at a, at a certain level, but. They need to communicate with each other. They can actually communicate and share file systems. They can communicate and share networks. The communications layer was confusing, and I feel like could really breed some security issues. Yeah, now, once you understand it, I think it has the potential, provided how much of a container is actually a container and not able to break out like we've seen with virtualization. Yep. But I think it breeds more security because you can say, well... You know, I've got this part of my application, and it really only needs to talk to this part of my application on this port. And when you're in Docker, you're like, well, I can just script that and design it that way, and then that's they're only talking to each other. And in a way, that's more. I find that it's more secure. Yeah, and so it's funny too. A lot of developers don't realize is that Docker containers by default are on the same network. Yeah, they don't even yeah. realize it. Yeah, and that's bad. <laughs> that's like yeah. the default is bad, right? Because yeah. people are going to do, especially when there's a learning curve to learn this new system, which there absolutely is. Yep, you're going to accept the default. And yeah, when you spin up a bunch of containers, they're all <laughs> talking to each other. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and creating env environment variables is another way in yeah. which you can share data. Very bad to take. Very dirty way of doing it. A dirty way to share it secrets, works, right? But. It's dirty <laughs> secrets, right? Because if you have a secret and it's an environment variable, I'm a Docker container, I'm now on that same network, I can see those environment variables potentially. Exactly. That can be bad. Uh, there was an article by, I forget his name. We're going to have him on, the, on one of our shows, maybe more than one. Uh, the Docker security guy. I can't remember his name. He's awesome. Great blog. Uh, fantastic, and really nice guy too. Um, it responded to my message and said, "Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come on and evangelize Docker security, which I think is that makes me hopeful that they have people, at least one person, yeah. that's evangelizing that." But he was like, "Yeah, no, don't share things in that way." And Absolutely. the communications layer worries me, like because you can create networks inside of Docker. Some of those networks can be public, and you can get very complex with your network. Absolutely, and I. At some level, I feel like we're going to have so much complexity that it's just going to be very fragile from a security standpoint. Yeah. And I'm worried about that. I mean, from developers, you know, I've done the same thing back in the day. You put everything public and, hey, it all works. We're happy. <laughs> and, and Docker lends itself to that oh, absolutely. Uh, as well. And I guess the encouragement is to really understand the technology. And in all the things we've talked about thus far, I, I really think that to achieve the optimum performance and scalability and security, it really means kind of hitting that middle ground, right? Not being so simplistic that everything is on its own network and everything is in its own container, but not being so complex that there's 18 networks for the same application with yeah. 500 containers that make up your application. You, you got to land somewhere in between. Exactly. Which I never really thought about it that way, but I think that's really sound advice. Mm -hmm. For, for And when you're a security person, you have to evaluate this technology because it's going to be used on your network. Mm -hmm. And it will be used on your network, I promise, at some point. Um, I think that's some really good kind of overarching advice thus far. Because uh, it's still newer technology. Yeah. I think even a couple of years ago, it may not have even been ready for production. I think in a lot of cases it still might not be. But I think I feel like it's come a, a long way since even a couple of years ago. Yeah, because LXC, um, Linux containers themselves, like the base underlying technology behind mm -hmm. Docker, came out, I believe, 2008, mm -hmm. 2009 was when it first came out. And then Google added the uh, the C groups. 
yep. for managing the resources a little better. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting because it kind of naturally evolved. And then Docker came out, I'm tempted to say, no more than five years ago. Mm-hmm. More like four and a half at best. Now, um, one of the things yeah. that's interesting uh, that Larry was talking about uh, on Paul Security Weekly, he said, you know, for a penetration testing environment, he's like, we basically spin up a whole bunch of VMs that we use for the pen test and then we spin them down. I'm like, that really lends itself to a Docker container environment like Absolutely. so much, right? But what he was asking, and I hadn't done the research and I haven't done much more research since then, uh, you've got experience with this, is Larry was like, well, you know, do I have to spin up a virtual machine and then put my Docker containers on it? Or can I just build Docker containers and just deploy them out to a cloud instance? Then we got talking about Amazon's container service. ECS. ECS. And my Twitter followers responded very loudly and said, not ready. We don't like it. We don't have enough control. We don't feel like it's the right solution for us. And I was like, well, that's really good feedback. Um, what's your experience with um, if you're an enterprise and you're looking at Docker and you say, hey, well, Amazon's got this great service for it. Like, what are the gotchas there? So I was working when I was doing consulting. I worked with a company seven months ago, mm-hmm. a large game design studio. They were deploying about... Mm, 750 containers. Mm-hmm. So, you know, not small, but, you know, not necessarily massive. Uh, they loved it. Uh, okay. For them, the ability to deploy the containers, um, to go through the whole testing process, build the Docker image, import it into ECS and go mm-hmm. was beautiful. They could, you know, edit a line of code, go through their entire test suite in an hour, which yeah. is amazing. We're, they're probably running around, I think, a thousand tests. Um, you know, they were really resilient, really, uh, they did stress testing as well, mm-hmm. and deploy it. And they were just like, yeah, this is how we do things. And it was like, wow. Now, granted, they were a younger company. They were maybe two years old. So they built everything green. They field. started from the ground up. They started from the ground yeah. up. Yeah. Now, I, if you're starting from the ground up, I definitely. Yeah. Well, and we were talking about the development process um, yep. as I know it, right? Like, when I was in college, I was a developer. And I was actually in charge of managing the upgrade of the version version control system software mm-hmm. uh, for the company. So I was very much involved with the development process. So this is where and you put on put on these text files and label and number the floppy disks. Uh, that that was definitely a thing. That was de- <laughs> there was definitely floppy disks and, and backup drives uh, yeah. involved. We actually used a software that was called PVS. Uh, uh, Coincidentally enough, <laughs> not the PVS. That's the passive vulnerability scanner. It was a uh, something versioning. Someone's probably yelling like what the software was. I went to training for it and everything. Right? Yeah, because I we started with branch uh, and SVN trunk. back in two thousand. SVN. So yep. So this was with. this was prior to um, SVN becoming really popular. In fact, okay. this was a proprietary version uh, control software, and I learned the development process. Right. And when I started to think about my own application as it matured from this small Python Flask application to something we really rely on today for the business. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we need to do like a whole build system. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I remember that is like you had development, you moved code from development into QA and you tested it. Maybe you did some stress testing or fuzz testing or whatever it is. You had QA scripts that maybe were automated somewhere by human. Once it passed there, then you move it into production. Then I started thinking about how we do software version control in Docker today and how much that just changes the game. And I'm like, it is like a completely different ball game today. I think security, in my mind, really benefits from that today. I don't know. Someone out there, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm kind of of the opinion right now that DevOps, as I, I, I think it's really is the right term to define what we have. When mm-hmm. you look, when I started looking under the covers, I'm like, this is so much better. This is so much better. Oh, yeah. And in applying containers and software version controls, Git as, as we know it today, I think you can have a really awesome system for moving code in and out of production. I think Netflix was the shining example of that, right? Yep. Uh, and their ability to do that. I'm like, this really just completely changed like 20 years ago what I thought of the software development process as. Fundamentally, it's still the same. Yeah. But the tools we have today with DevOps, when you look at the real... I mean, we've talked at a high level on previous shows about it, but when I like really looked at it in my own environment, and I'm like, that's awesome. I think what's changed a lot since you know the 90s, 2000, because uh, I started in 2000, mm-hmm. is we've really finally standardized on a lot of the components we're using. You know, granted, we still have a you know a diverse ecosystem of Windows, Red Hat, yeah. CentOS, Fedora, Debian, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE if you're in Europe, um, etc. 
But for the most part, we've standardized on what we're going to use for components. You know, what is it, like 65 to 70% of the web is running Apache? Um, that's kind of nice. It's nice to have that kind of platform you can I think build on top of. Be, and Nginx is really... Nginx is coming up a lot, yeah. Uh, I've, Nginx is real nice. I've converted almost 100% to Nginx on all of my applications. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I like it. I, you do run into it. So I think you gain a little more control. You definitely gain a lot of more performance. Yeah. Um, all of the Docker, a lot of the, well, almost all the Docker stuff that I've seen is very heavily based on Nginx. I think it's smaller, lighter weight. Um, it gives you more control in the configuration, although you do run into limitations. You'll appreciate this being a developer. There's no uh, conditional or or conditional not in their if statements. Huh. After the show, I'll explain to you how some examples told me to get around that. Yeah, I got to look at some examples for that. I, that's I, interesting. I, I thought it was fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's really weird. I thought weird. that it's not something that I should be using in production. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, I'm wondering if they did that just for the ability to do caching. Because yeah, I think it's start, a, I think it's totally a performance thing. I agree. Yeah, because if you do yeah. knots, those are those are basically wildcards. Yeah. So those are a lot more difficult to cache. That's my that's my guess. Yeah. Hmm, no, I agree. Cool. Um, so anyway, I think development wise, <clears throat> and I think security wise, once you get over the complexity and over that hurdle, if you're not starting from the ground up. Mm. Like the ability to just push new code out and revert back is so much greater yeah. in, this, in this newer environment. Security is going to benefit. It's what we've called DevOps under the covers of this technology. After I've looked at it, I'm like, this is really good. I don't see, other than the complexity factor, I don't see many drawbacks to deploying software uh, in this way now. I think it's, I think it's awesome. Yeah, and I like it too because you know this whole DevOps movement, Docker really embodies it because it's it's an overlapping tool that makes it quick and easy for a developer to do what an operations engineer would have done. Yeah, yeah, and that's absolutely. great. Um, so you know, being more modular, I I worry about attack surface, right? Yeah, like does it increase or decrease your attack surface or it's implementation to specific <coughs> thing. Does, is it like the same thing? Like, is your attack surface the same? It just happens to be more modular? Like, I, 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 that's what I would say, yeah. Because, again, like we talked about the network, if you put every container publicly facing, that's a huge attack surface. But right. if you correctly segment your network, then, yeah, you can make a much smaller attack surface for it. Have you seen attacks that, and because I know if you're the enterprise security person and you're familiar with virtualization and you start looking at Docker, your yeah. next logical question is, so I'm in this container. Like, how can I break out of that container? Mm -hmm. Have you seen attacks that allow containers to do things they're not supposed to in terms of breaking out of the container? Oh, absolutely. So when you think of terms of what a container is, it's just a program mm. running in, in Linux memory. Um, and it is a Linux technology. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do a kernel exploit, then you know that Linux container is running in kernel memory. And you actually have access to a wide swath of... Uh, Linux kernel command calls. <clears throat> so, because I've spent a lot of time working with um, Linux kernel vulnerabilities, you have things, uh, one that came out like five months ago, I think, it was like DCCP, mm -hmm. which is a protocol I've never even heard of before, <laughs> before that mm -hmm. vulnerability came out. Um, but the point is, if you're in the Linux container, or if you're in the Docker container, Linux container, Docker container, doesn't really mm -hmm. matter, same thing. If you're in that container and you can make that vulnerable function call to the kernel, that's how you break out. Oh. So it comes back. Because the container still needs to talk to the kernel. So exactly. you have access to the hosts. Yeah. So Similar virtualization, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So if you're running a really old version of Linux that you haven't upgraded the kernel for, then yeah, breaking out of the container is super easy. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I think we've yet to see a lot of attacks like that. Not yet. To be honest with you. Not yet. Um, so uh, one of the questions that I get from a lot of folks, right, is... Well, why wouldn't I just use virtualization? Like from a security and deployment perspective, Larry and I have talked about it and we're like, well, why wouldn't I just deploy a VM? Like why would I go through all this work of containers when I can, can I, can I just deploy a VM? to Like you're going to talk about in the next segment, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. we're going to talk about deploying VMs rather than containers. Like why would, what are the, uh, any kind of factors that differentiate um, and help people from a security perspective primarily, but from a deployment perspective as well, the difference between virtualization and uh, a container-based system. Yeah, so when you're building virtual machines, you know, in Linux, they're called, or when it's like Amazon, they're called AMIs. Those are moderately difficult to build. 
you know, I use Packer for some of these things to build yep. my custom AMIs. Um, Packer is its own. Is tools. it Vagrant? Vagrant's not for AMIs, though. Vagrant's for Vagrant uh, can be used to make AMIs primarily for VirtualBox, right? Mo- yeah. So okay. Vagrant's. Yeah, whole other discussion on that one. Vagrant can deploy to Amazon, but okay, yeah, don't worry about it. I got you. <laughs> whole other tool set. Um, but the point is, trying to build your own custom AMIs, that's moderately difficult. Mm. But when you use Docker, it's one command. Oh, okay. Because you push it to the Docker registry, either public or private, mm-hmm. and then that can be imported one step into Amazon ECS. Mm-hmm. I got so you. that's a that's way easier than trying to do some of the things I do mm-hmm. with you know building custom AMIs. You talk to any developer, even in enterprise companies, building custom AMIs is a nightmare. Mm. So, so in terms of deploying it out to the cloud, yeah, um, Docker makes things way easier. Way easier. I got you. That makes a lot of sense. Why it, it's seeing the uh, adoption. Yep. Any other security concerns that you have? You've got a lot more experience with Docker than I do. You also have a security mm-hmm. background as well. Any I, concerns we haven't talked about? I mean. Docker, Docker is revolutionary. It is different, but a lot of the same security concerns we've had since, you know, was it the uh, the days of Multics? Yep. Shout out to uh, Jack Daniel on that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we have the same security problems. It, it's You know what's interesting, and, and I don't know if you've thought about this way, but I, when I was talking with Doug White about this uh, to wrap up this segment is the way that uh, when Doug was working with mainframes, he's like, dude, it's the same thing. It's the same problem, but they're at different it's, layers now. They've been moved. Yes. The problem's been moved around. Mm-hmm. So, Cool. All right. We're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about managing AWS cloud resources. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 